Welcome to tonight's InfoWars Nightly News broadcast. The date is Wednesday, November 16, 2011. I'm Aaron Dykes sitting in, and tonight really is a tale of the parasites versus the plebiscites as we have insider trading and the feds taking over and uh, Occupy Wall Street protesters being pushed out of their parks and clamped down upon. We'll get into that in just a moment. Later in the broadcast, we have an exclusive interview that our camera guys got with Immortal Technique. Uh, he's a very prominent rapper in the anti-New World Order circles. He's been covering issues like 9-11 for a long time. That's coming up in the broadcast, but first in the news, there are timing questions that have emerged in the MF Global customer cash shortfall. That's because at least 200 million uh, was found to be short October 27, just days before the firm uh, declared bankruptcy after bad bets on the European sovereign debt crisis. MF Global Holdings Limited may have faced a shortfall in customer funds even as far back as October 27. Just hours before the bankruptcy filing, MF Global executives told regulators they believed a shortfall had somehow occurred, possibly starting on October 27 or October 28th, the people told the paper. Then that number later went to 600 million. Then in Paul Joseph Watson's report, based on Bloomberg and other reports, you find out the number's really almost $900 million, of which there was a shortfall. In Paul Watson's article, MF Global looted customers' accounts via internal bank run, but the big players got a warning ahead of time that the financial broker was set to collapse. And you go on to find out that uh, many people were warned and there were miraculous uh, transfers just before the firm went bankrupt uh, and billions of dollars were transferred. And why was there a shortfall? Well, we'd all like to know. You've heard Gerald Salente on this broadcast last night and on the Alex Jones Show today talking about his personal losses in MF Global, how they shorted him and some 21,000 other customers, according to these reports. And at least one CFTC commissioner is upset about it. Bart Chilton, a Democratic commissioner of the U.S. Commodity Futures Trading, uh, who reports on the 600 million missing. The money's not where it should be. I think something nefarious has happened, potentially something illegal. Yeah, you think so. Possibly nefarious, possibly illegal. Obviously should be looked into, but neither MF Global nor its former chief, John Corzine, who just resigned, uh, has yet been charged with anything. And so we'll see how that develops. But they do report that many customers will be getting at least 60% of their money back, uh, which would be a number figuring 520 million out of the total 869 million. Uh, that was essentially stolen and uh, questionably transferred just before the bankruptcy. Something to watch. Meanwhile, New York police have ousted the Occupy Wall Street from Zuccotti Park, and Mayor Bloomberg said that decision was his and his alone. Mine and mine alone, the quote says. We'll get more into later how it was not his decision. It was coordinated federally through 18 cities. Uh, but they did get everyone out of the park, all their tents, belongings, and uh, they brought in the sanitation workers who said, we're going to disinfect the hell out of this place, calling it a safety hazard and so forth and so on, saying it was a haven for criminals. Uh, we have some of the video now from Luke Radowski of We Are Change's coverage of the ousting of the occupiers. <laughs> Uh, so they're pushing them out here, and then we have another clip where they're beating people in tents and pushing other people back. And we're going to show you coming up, too, where they have the sound cannons waiting and ready to go. And uh, so you'll hear some of the protesters chanting, uh, reciting the First Amendment, which certainly should apply even over these civil codes, but that's the very premise the police are using. Yeah. 
And then, as if it wasn't enough to violate the First Amendment of the actual occupiers, we also have a clip of them pushing the various press members back, including Luke, who was repeatedly told he had to move further and further down the sidewalk and away from what was going on. Now, let's play that clip, too. Yeah, so you can see here that this this part of the crowd is almost all journalists. Everybody's got cameras clicking away. They're being pushed back by police also. And of course, all these people, regardless of what you may think of their views, are completely protected by the First Amendment, except when they're not in a de facto clampdown from the New York police. But of course, it was not just isolated in New York. It happened everywhere, among other places, Oakland. In fact, it happened in at least 18 cities where there were Occupy protests going on. And Washington's blog puts together how Homeland Security coordinated the 18-city police crackdown on Occupy protesters. And chief among that is the o Oakland mayor, Jean Kwan, who admitted there was a coordination, there was a conference call uh, going on prior to this. They discussed, uh, among other things, how to use city codes uh, to have an excuse to get people out, uh, you know, sanitation and safety premises, as they did in New York. You also have mayors and police chief mayors and police chiefs who talk strategy on protests that's in the ap and they admit that uh they you know wanted to urge the removal and that they would you know use excuses like the criminal element supposedly showing up supposed gang activity the presence of homeless people just seeking food and all the rest of it but what you really got here is a federal coordinated crackdown. They, quote, advised to seek a legal reason during these conference calls that focused on zoning laws and existing curfew rules to skirt the protection of the First Amendment, the first among the Bill of Rights, which were not to be uh, violated for any reason instead of any reason you could think of, as you see here in this disgusting crackdown on Occupy protest. And it happened all at once. And it's just disgusting that Homeland Security has, in fact, been turned against the people. They started off at the beginning of the Patriot Act uh, with violating the Fourth Amendment and so forth and so on, down to the TSA searches. And now it's down to the First Amendment. Um, I guess the Second Amendment's really all that's left. Uh, but I'm sure Homeland Security will find a way to come after that as well. And there's more articles confirming it. Wonkett reported on it. Surprise, surprise, Homeland Security coordinated the crackdown. Uh, you've got the examiner uh, who spoke to someone in the Justice Department who confirmed that indeed it was Homeland Security who coordinated these conference calls among the police chiefs and mayors of these various cities. So we'll look more into that as it continues to develop. In other Homeland Security and Department of Justice news, the Department of Justice is trying to make it a crime to, quote, lie on the Internet. And here, uh, Kurt Nemo reports on how they plan to use the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act to possibly punish not only serious cybercrime or hacking incidences, but people who simply lie or provide false information, violating terms of service of third parties on the internet uh, and they give the example in digital trends of <clears throat> reporting a fake name on Facebook, lying about your weight on a dating site or using Google if you're under the age of 18. So not only does this have the potential to criminalize ordinary behavior, it's also a ready-made excuse to crack down on political activity which we know irks the system. They've been trying to take on supposed conspiracy websites in numerous ways. Uh, we know the Department of Defense, among others, have been deployed to counter conspiracy theorists and take them on in the cyber world. We know people like Cass Sunstein have called for disruption and outright infiltration of conspiracy theorist groups. And now they just have another tool they can use to crack down on that or any other group. We're all at risk 
It's definitely one of those hang together, hang separate situations as uh, they really try to bring in new levels of tyranny as they try to shut down what was once the Wild West of the Internet. And it's going to become very corporate, and Alex has reported on all of that Internet 2.0 plan already. So we'll see what happens there. Now, uh, we have more news coming up, but right now we have the first part of that exclusive interview with Immortal Technique. And uh, he's really been someone who's been out there on the 9-11 issue, on a lot of other important issues. He was extremely critical of Bush during his years. And uh, let's just see what he has to say now. Make you a hero, war the ground zero The devil crept into heaven, God overslept on the 7th The new world order was born on September 11th All the things that are happening, like what tops the list right it's now? It's very difficult to pick just one thing that tops the list of things that are happening in the world now. I think an interesting thing to look at is uh, America's foreign policy that really hasn't changed under Obama as was promised. In fact, I think being that the Republicans in the 2012 race are focusing so much on the economy, it, it's kind of uh, an unspoken truth that Obama is a war president. He's not someone who came in here and shut down Guantanamo Bay like he said he was going to. I, I think one other interesting thing is the continued sort of push and pull between Republicans and Democrats uh, for show about what they're going to do about the Wall Street situation. Um, Occupy Wall Street has definitely had its impact on the process, but I think it's going to take a little bit more than just them. They're going to need to, to push through specific policy or to pressure individuals who are in power enough to make a decision. So I think between that internal struggle and the outward foreign policy issues, um, there's definitely plenty to worry about or concern yourself with if you look at the global field. I've been visiting as many occupies as I possibly can on the road for this uh, martyr tour, and I think one of the things that's most striking to me is how even though they're trying to work more and more cohesively on uh, a strategy that's encompassing of the entire movement, it's incredibly important that they not lose sight of the fact that they do have internal problems within just that area, that they have problems that just fit that that specific county or region which they should deal with. And I think that's very important, I, and I see them continuously doing that, whether it's homelessness, drug abuse, things that may not be uh, solely relegated to where they're from, but that they have to deal with on a local level and not just a federal quote-unquote war on drugs, blanket on everything. You know, it's very per personable. You know, when people get help there, they're getting from someone whose first name they know. When they're talking about these horrible issues of homelessness or homeless families, these are people that have also lost their home. They're talking to people who can identify with their struggle, not some government agency that's faceless and really lives in a dimension without compassion. Any group that poses a significant uh, amount of collateral or can raise leverage against any government agency is going to try to be co-opted by just about anybody. Yeah. Whether it's far left or far right or what even designates that that title, you know, that that's up for grabs too when it comes to these because you may find factions of a group which are less inclined to be um, in line with the complete strategy, but say, okay, I've been working with this guy's, whether it's a left-wing group or a right-wing group for 10, 20 years, I haven't seen the results I want. Here's the raw power and energy of a very, very active and aggressive group of people that are aggressively and actively demonstrating, and yet they have not, like the police, unfortunately, have descended into violence and blind anarchy. I think when they see the power of that movement, the nonviolent protest, but also the, the, the ability to confront government, that's something they want to have uh, in their arsenal of weapons. So why wouldn't anybody try and infiltrate it? Whether it will be infiltrated, I think is another story. You know, we're talking about a wide collective group of people. Sure. And this is, if anything else, regardless of what people want to say about them, they're not stupid people at all. Some of them are very educated, and when I say educated, it just doesn't mean that they paid an overpriced uh, bill for a piece of paper with their name on it. Some of them are individuals that have built an incredible reserve of knowledge about the Fed, 
you know, about the history of the Zen, or when it started, or how to get off of it, you know, people that have ideas about how to change the system, that I think, you know, bear mentioning. There should also be a conversation, I think, in private, you know. Not all of the conversations that Republicans, Democrats, or even people who run this show or run any business happen completely in public. Sometimes for the integrity and for the protection of the individuals that work for it, sometimes for the protection of the message so it doesn't become marginalized, sabotaged, or diluted, they do things behind closed doors. And I told the people from the very beginning that those type of actions were going to need to take place, not in uh, uh, the, the, the vein of government secrecy to protect government, but rather to make sure that you know innocent people don't end up being victimized. I, I think it's important for people to realize that the only thing that this movement is is really, really at its heart trying to do is make America a more honest country, is make America a less corrupt country, you know? Now, of course, there's always going to be some nut with a sign that says, you know, aliens are coming or repent, it's the last day. But at the end of the day, we know what the core message of the Occupy people is. So regardless of who has an issue with it or, or, or who has a problem with it, you know, you can reserve your commentary and your anger until the 2012 election when it really comes down to it, which we're right about at the doorstep of. Well, I mean, I'm not an economist, so I can't tell people how to balance their budget, or I, I can't come with a bunch of promises that I'm not capable of fulfilling. <coughs> but I think what I can tell people is this, that <coughs> in every situation where you have massive amounts of government corruption, uh, you can't rely on the people who broke the system to fix it. You know, you can't rely on overpaid Congress who doesn't really see a problem other than, fa than the fact that their constituency is angry, not actually the suffering of the people. And I'm not going to speak for all of them, but for the vast majority that have ab done absolutely nothing. You know, it's funny that, you know, some of them want to blame the president as if they have some solution to the problem themselves. I'm not saying that the president's way is the most efficient or the right way. I'm just saying that they offer no other solution. You know, even when we talk about any other topic, you know, whether it's immigration, okay, deport 12 million people. That's not feasible. That's not possible. Uh, it's physically impossible. Um, it, it would collapse the American economy. Um, it plays into the idea that, you know, you don't understand the history of this country because not all European Americans came through Ellis Island. Uh, not all of this country was gotten through a legal means. In fact, most of it was stolen land from Native American people that if you drive from Louisiana to Houston, you'll see they did absolutely nothing with. So what was the point of stealing it from a bunch of people? When I say stealing, I know that red-blooded Americans get angry. They, some of them get they even have a violent response to it. How could you say we stole anything? No one in this country has ever done anything wrong. Really? Because we use nice words for things. So when you say a pilgrim or a settler, you don't think of a, a land stealer, an invader, a robber, a thief. You know? I, I deprived the woman of a virginity. No, you're a rapist. That's what you are. So I, I think when we get rid of the mythology of America, then we begin to understand a, a clearer reaction to it. In terms of the Occupy movement, I think that's something that's incredibly important, going back to the very beginning of how all this started and seeing the different reaction that people have towards the, the fiscal crisis. Some people saying, oh, it's all these you know, people who are living below their means that tried to buy extra houses when they shouldn't have. Oh, okay, you mean the uneducated class of individuals that, as they're referred to by you know, people on Fox or whatever that we put, place the blame solely on them, or the predatory lenders who know everything about business, who've been doing this to people for 30 or 40 years, who's more to blame? You know, the sucker who walks in thinking, damn, I'm gonna be able to give my family a nicer home, and here's a guy who's explaining it to me, and it all sounds like it's gonna work out, when in reality, here's this snake oil salesman telling you that everything's gonna be great, and it's really not. You know, at some point, if America truly is the country it is, it has to confront people like that. And it has to make sure that it, it doesn't allow its citizenry to Literally, be taken advantage of in that way. Fighting for freedom and fighting terror, but what's reality? Read about the history of the... And we're about to go to break. We'll have more with the moral technique coming up in the second half, as well as more news. But I wanted to first tell you about the PrisonPlanet.tv specials we have going on 
from now until Christmas. Uh, there's two different ones. One is an Alex Everything special. They are called the Info Warrior, where you can get 18 films and a subscription for PrisonPlanet.tv for a whole year for a combined total of $129.95. Sounds like a lot, but think about everything. You get 18 physical DVDs and a subscription you can share with up to five other people. You can also get just the subscription under this Patriot offer here for $39.95, 44% off of the normal price. And uh, we always offer discounts, but never one this good except during the Christmas special. So we hope you'll check that out. That is one of the main ways you help support this broadcast and we're trying to reach more people we're trying to bring you diverse voices not even people we always agree with everything they say but we are trying to undermine the mainstream corporate scripted message here and get out at least some truth as much as we can and we need your help getting that word out so stick with us we'll be back after the break if you believe in this information I want to support it's viral spread go to the infowars store at infowars.com we've got the new gi joe infowars t-shirts we've got the incredible pro pure gravity fed filters available at infowars.com in the store we've got a new dvd sign us under attack the don't tread on me flag we've got all sorts of different bumper stickers to help spread the rebellion virally it's all there wristbands citizen rule books in every order Order online at InfoWars.com today. The water filters, the canteens, it's all there. InfoWars.com. We are back from break. I'm still Aaron Dyke sitting in on this InfoWars nightly news transmission. Now, in other news about how the feds know best, we have Homeland Security's linked group now training citizens in Colorado that their best pal could be a terrorist. And it goes on to explain how there's a course in quote unquote uh, community awareness programming that uh, is funded by this organization and they've produced a video previously saying that buying gold is a suspicious activity and a number of other uh, ordinary kinds of events. And it's a woman named Diana Woodson and uh, she's training people basically that, uh, you know, says here an ex-Marine from Lakewood whose wife gives him the evil eye when he's sizing up potential threats at Denver Airport uh, as a problem, as well as a scenario where a New Yorker refuses to ride on subways and spends as little time as possible in high-rise buildings. So it's setting this whole atmosphere of being paranoid wherever you are. Uh, and then it goes on uh, to explain how this course teaches you that even your closest neighbor could be a terrorist. It's not gonna be the person you think it's gonna be, said Woodson. He's your best neighbor, your best pal. He doesn't always look like the bad guy. It could be someone unassuming. And that's a course called Counterterrorism Education Learning Lab, or CELL, a little uh, term they throw around to make it sound tough. And uh, I think we have here some clips from the previous video they produced on how buying gold so evil where they got uh, John Elway, another talented NFL guy, to work for Homeland Security. I'm reminded of the morning of September 11, 2001. I remember turning on the television and saying, how can this possibly be happening in the United States of America? Well, it's something that we're going to have to deal with the rest of our lives. The horrific events of September 11 and the Oklahoma City bombing have made it clear that terrorism is not only a very real threat abroad, but also right here at home. Anyone can become a victim of terrorism, anytime, anywhere. Some terrorists even gain employment to monitor day-to-day -day activities to gather detailed information about their target. Have you ever been on a bus or a light rail and noticed a bag that has been left unattended? This could be an example of a terrorist determining how long it takes for people or security to respond. Terrorists not only need to raise money, but they also need to transfer and spend it in a way that doesn't bring attention to themselves. There are many signs to watch out for, such as witnessing an unusually large transaction that's paid for with cash or gift cards. Any of these surveillance methods may be a sign that something isn't right, and you should report it to the kayak. It's important for all of us to realize when a terrorist incident occurs, it affects everyone. You can make a difference in helping stop an attack by being able to recognize the eight signs of terrorism and alert the authorities. If you or a family member sees any sort of suspicious activity, you shouldn't attempt to stop a suspect. Rather, report it immediately by calling 911 or the kayak. 
Uh, so there you have it. Just more implication that if you're selling gold or talking to your neighbors or trying to sell something secondhand, that could be suspicious. This is all about supposedly training people to trust the federal government, Homeland Security, and not trusting the people you actually know. And notice how, too, it's not about Muslim terrorists infiltrating the country. It's about targeting, watching, surveilling, being paranoid of other ordinary Americans because this is an apparatus meant to descend upon the American people. And you've seen countless example of it if you've been following this program at all here it is again and it's just absolutely disgusting a little tip we can take this back to kindergarten the stranger is the federal government the stranger is homeland security you don't know those people it's it's statistically known uh what kind of creeps fill up those uh agencies meanwhile you need to count on your neighbors or the people you actually know that's all we really have in this world uh we also have the special ops commander who says the seal raid book is a lie because it goes against the just ridiculous official account of the killing of bin laden it's just not true a u.s special operations command spokesman Colonel Tim Nye said it's not how it happened. Uh, so even though they staged the Situation Room photo with Obama, Hillary, and the other gaggle of people, even though they threw the body overseas uh, without any, um, over into the ocean without any evidence, even though their own account was repeatedly debunked and witnesses on the ground uh, said a lot of other things happened, uh, this account can't be true either. It's really kind of, uh, as this suggests, choose your own adventure. Choose the story you want to believe because no evidence has ever been put forward that bin Laden had anything to do with 9-11 or really that he was even killed here in this special operation. You've seen SEAL Team 6 uh, take a lot of losses without a lot of explanation. And here again uh, from this far guy that they're saying not to trust is another account of uh, the helicopter crashing during the raid. We got that again from witnesses on the ground in Pakistan. So you choose what to believe. I'm sure it'll be the federal government. Uh, we also have a update on the Occupy protests. They have uh, reclaimed some of them anyway, their place in Zakati Park, and they're planning to have a larger protest tomorrow, Thursday. And they've also got a lot of lawyers backing them up, telling them that they do have a right to reenter. We'll see what happens there. We do hope it remains peaceful on both sides. We know there could be provocateurs within the protest groups. And we know police, unfortunately, have a tendency to overreact sometimes, especially when they've been given orders to regard people as uh, not really within their rights to simply protest under the First Amendment. Uh, we take you now to more from our exclusive Immortal Technique Out interview. Speed, the land of the free, home of the brave, indigenous holocaust, and the home of the slaves, corporate America, dancing off beat to the rhythm. You there definitely are people that are fed up with how it is, so they're looking at alternative forms of media, whether it's this or any other. And at the same time, it, you have to realize not every one source of media is, you know, the, the voice from the burning bush. You know, at some point, it, it's incredibly important for people to watch this show, or to listen to any news outlet they might have heard and cross-reference that information to do some heavy research, you know, not just to believe something insightful that's said, you know, because we fall in danger of having fear-mongering be a tool not just of the right or the left, but of the independent media sources. You know, I, I think, though, that this program, others like this, and the ones that are appearing on, on cable television or the ones that appear even as satire like The Daily Show. Uh, what's the whole point of it? To ask questions that people aren't normally asking. What's the point of this program? To ask questions that you won't hear normally on mainstream media. Now are people going to criticize it and say that it's conspiracy theory? Sure, because they've never understood what a conspiracy really is. You know, they don't know that people got together behind closed doors to decide how their life would actually be the shape of their home, the, the shape of their neighborhood, the red line districts in, in many cities, which define how people are sectioned off based upon race and class. Someone else who's not you, who didn't have a democratic process of election to have these issues pushed through, push them through. If anything's, you know, a conspiracy, look at the war in Iraq. A group of individuals who decide, okay, we're in Afghanistan, we've got bin Laden cornered, what we really ought to do is redeploy, you know, tens of thousands of troops to a country that doesn't have nuclear weapons, but that we're going to say has nuclear weapons. Uh, that didn't work, so now we've got to come up with chemical weapons, now we're scrambling for different ideas. You know, I, I hate to bring it back to that, but unfortunately, I, I think that people shouldn't 
be so afraid of you know a, a news outlet or a competitive independent media source as they should be afraid of just believing whatever they hear or, or, or to be suckered into a quick solution to an issue because there is none most of these are multi-layered issues not everybody is gonna agree with every politician about everything you know like someone was interviewing me about Ron Paul I and, I, and I, I said you know there were some things about him that I really liked and then they said well what about this and that and I said well you know I, that's a little you know idealistic and then I remember there were people that were angry because I didn't agree with everything he said like you know how can a man agree with everything that and no disrespect to him but this is true he's a politician you know he lobbies his days in Congress he argues bills you know he represents a constituency that isn't me he represents them how am I gonna agree with him about everything that's right for the people that live in his part of America rather versus the people that live in mine obviously they're different or he would be the congressman of Harlem who by the way is a corrupt individual who happens to be a Democrat and I think that that has no bearing on it Democrat or Republican I mean people have gotten used to eating at the same trough no wonder they don't have any table manners. I mean it's just the way it is applying our vision of how the world would be on other people is absurd you know what That's if what someone or, were to do that to us and tell, come in here and say oh you know like I explain to people when they're a little confused about the black or Latino experience in America or in the hemisphere I said you know imagine if someone really did invade the Middle East you know not this thing that we did where we sent a proxy in to fight against other people or the Bush way where we take a few countries over but really hardcore old school from antiquity invasion you know the, the, the rape of women the decimation of children the, the destruction of religion the destruction of a people's culture to convince them that the Quran is a, is a fraud to convince them that the Prophet Muhammad never existed that he's not a real figure in history right Imagine someone doing that to America, coming here, convincing everybody, you know, Jesus Christ is a myth. The Bible is a fairy tale. You know, you're all going to worship a different God, the one that I designate. You're also going to give your children to me. Everything about you that made you an American is going to disappear. Congratulations, you've just discovered the black and Latino experience for 400 years. That is the, the transfer of power. But that's not all of our history. That's not who we are as a people that's unfortunately a small period of time within our history now drawing from that example you can apply it to a much larger uh, scale to show people listen if we're suffering here in this particular point in America that doesn't mean that we have to stay in that position forever there is an amount of organizing that is we're capable of doing there are actions that can be taken I really won't like them to get violent because I know how easily that can can turn into utter chaos but I'm telling you right now that if anything isn't done then maybe that is the government strategy to push people towards absolute breaking point status and then clamp down on them violently which is what a lot of people feel like is going on if you see the Occupy protest it's a blueprint for what people are worried about who concern themselves with that uh, the city the state, the, the, the police in Oakland or, or in New York, goading the protesters, you know, uh, pepper spraying women. You know, at some point, people were going to break, and yet they haven't. You know, if you're going to call them violent protesters, I think it, it falls into a contradiction when you have 20 to 25,000 people in a mob in downtown New York. Hey, if we wanted to rip the city apart, we could have right then and there. We didn't tear the city up. Why? Because we love the city. Yeah. We didn't ruin America. Why? Because we love America. Obviously a lot more than the people who claim that they do simply because they wave a flag. We want to make the country a more efficient place, a better place. We want people to invest in America. And I think one of the greatest failures of American capitalism was just in investing in systems and institutions. Those are great, but they have to also be matched with uh, uh, investing in people. You know, huge bailout for institutions and banks, none for people. You know, we give grants to universities, we need more grants for students that want to stay here. I think more than the message of materialism, uh, 
what you're speaking about is the braggadocio attitude of hip-hop. I think the message of materialism is one aspect of that. To say that I'm better than you, I can say it in many ways. I can beat you in a fight. I'm stronger than you. I'm bigger. I have more people on the street. I got more guns. I have prettier women. This has always been kind of a back and forth, kind of teasing, uh, uh, almost a, a vaudeville, but also very taken very seriously in the streets when people put their reputation up on the line. But I, I think having more money uh, was something that came to the forefront as a part of the corporate involvement in hip hop, and therefore them wanting to use that to be the ultimate trump card to say, okay, who's got more skills? That's great. I'm glad that you can rap better than me, but I've got more money than you, so I'm better than you. You know, or you know, technically I can free, you can freestyle better than me, but my videos on MTV and yours isn't, so I must be better than you. You know what I mean? It, it, it plays in every aspect of life. Think about it. Imagine if I'm a college professor, emeritus, Harvard. You know, I have wonderful ideas about the economy. They just so happen to help my friends that are themselves working in Goldman Sachs or somewhere else. You, you're a camera dude working for a show. But you know what? You've spent the last 20 years, excuse my language, researching, digging through books, reading the history of America, reading the history of the economic collapses that have occurred throughout civilizations through the passage of time. And you've amassed an incredible amount of knowledge and you present that simply because I have more letters behind my name and I work for some fancy institution, people are going to believe me and they'll go so far, as to so far as to ridicule you, which is what happens in hip hop. doesn't matter how dope people are, doesn't matter if they're incredibly skilled, I got more money than you, so I win. That's, if that's not a corporate, I said so, I told you so. I, I don't know what is, so I, I link it directly to that. Why? Because a corporation that makes 14 billion dollars a year profit. Mind you, I think you all out there know the difference between gross and net. I, I don't mean gross, I mean net profit, 14 billion dollars. They come back one year, instead of making 14, they make 13 million. That company's looked at as a failure. Failure? You just made 13 billion dollars in a year! How are you a failure? Because you're not growing because you're not expanding, because you're not buying people, because you're not taking more, because you're not more aggressive, because you're not living up to being the virus that we all thought you could be. It's hard because I know a lot of my colleagues, and these are people that are involved in hip-hop and may not be uh, as political as myself, but they're also thinking minds. You know, these may be people who uh, work regular jobs, but they're thinking minds, and they think to my, themselves, what does my vote really count for, you know? And I say to them that they should start with a local election and look at the numbers. Those numbers are decided by hundreds, and in some cases decided by tens, and in some cases decided by single-digit numbers. I mean, even if you look at, at Minnesota, at the, the Al Franken situation. Wasn't his vote like 127? Some ridiculous number like that. You can affect change in a certain way. I think what they feel disenfranchised by is that the candidate that they elected had all these promises and none of them come through. That, in, in an essence, makes them feel more frustrated than anything else. But I don't think they should stop voting for it. I think, though, there should be severe campaign reform. And when I say severe, I mean, like, you know, we're talking limitations to who can, you know, uh, come up with billions and billions of dollars from other people, you know, the amount of debates that need to happen, the airtime that we afford individuals, the honest answers that we demand from people uh, instead of allowing them to just glance off. You know, I remember when, even though he, he's not necessarily known as the world's most moral man, but I remember when John Edwards uh, challenged President Cheney in a debate very late. I thought he should have come out much earlier with this about him voting against uh, Martin Luther King Jr.'s uh, birthday and all these other things that kind of exposed the, the weak underbelly of the right's issues with race. Not to say the left doesn't have them, because we all heard Harry Reid's comments about you know Obama being a 
quote unquote well spoken Negro. But I mean, it, it definitely does expose the, the right's more difficult way of, of covering that up and, and saying, all right, well, why didn't you? And when he says, you know, I believe my record speaks for itself, you know, there was almost like, okay, well, we'll accept that. And at some point, we don't need to accept that. At some point, the voting audience has to say, no, I, I don't know that your record stands for itself because I don't know what you're saying anymore. You claim that there's still a presence of Al Qaeda in Iraq, dude, we've gone over this, you know. How many hearts do you need to have in your chest before you come up with the right answer? At some point, you know, you just need to be honest with the American public and admit that you made a mistake. That's also another issue. They don't see accountability, so they feel uninspired to get behind a candidate. When someone comes out and said, no, this was my fault, I did this, you know. Uh, uh, Katrina, Bush, no accountability. You know, I'm sorry, I, I should have done more. I thought it was all in Brownie's hands. He was doing a heck of a job. Well, he wasn't doing a heck of a job. He wasn't doing any job. And as a result, American citizens, you know, I know there are some people watching this that, you know, they would probably be less affected if they weren't American citizens. But I, I, as a person that believes in God and, and really feels the pain of innocent people, it doesn't matter if they were citizens or not, they were people who were dying because of the negligence and the corruption in the American system. When you have an Arabian horse racer put in charge of FEMA, you know, when people see that happen, when they see that cronyism, that's when they get uninspired. I would just tell them that if they don't vote, they're going to see more of the same. The martyr doesn't come from the idea of needing to die for revolution. It comes from the idea of needing to live for revolution. You know, in the martyr, the martyr's perception in, for example, pedagogy of the oppressed is that the revolutionary must become the martyr because there are parts of him that must die. The selfishness, the ego. This is a process of death. It's not like just one day he wakes up like, oh, you know, now I don't have any issues. I, I can look past race and sexual orientation and, and class and get to the core problems that people have and how they need to be addressed. That's a process. That's a process that I've taken years and years to address, you know, updating my music, updating my flow, updating my skills, you know, updating the way my message gets across to people. So I, I would say it's more based upon that, not the necessity to, to give your life uh, in terms of, of killing yourself or destroying yourself, but of giving your life by dedicating yourself, by working hard. And maybe not in a conventional way, you know, maybe you are a revolutionary lawyer, a revolutionary doctor, an independent journalist, you know, maybe you, you offer health care to people in the hood, maybe you do take pro bono cases, maybe you're a psychologist that deals with underprivileged children that are the victims of abuse. I don't know. You can't save everybody, but you can save someone. And you can't fathom the truth, so you don't hear me. You think Illuminati's just a fucking conspiracy theory? It's That's our show for tonight. We want to thank the crew for going out and doing the hard work to get those kinds of exclusive interviews like the one you just saw with the Moral Technique. And we want to remind you, the viewers, that subscribing to PrisonPlanet.tv is one of the best ways to support us, help us get the word out more. And one of the best ways to subscribe is with this holiday special where you can sign up for a discounted price of $39.95. Or you could get the DVDs too, 18 of them, with the subscription for a full year for $129.95. Share the subscription with your friends and family or even strangers. Give them the passcode, uh, not your personal data passcodes, but one you can make ready to share with people and help us spread the word about this transmission and reach more people before it's too late. Thanks for tuning in. Alex will be back later. For tonight, that's all we have. <laughs>